Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. You also have put out information about John Dowd, who many will remember as the president's lawyer in the Mueller probe, who had represented uh, Mr. Parnas. Uh, what is the thrust of that? Is there an allegation of, of some untoward lawyering on behalf of the, the president there? Well, we put that out in a, uh, a, a document that we filed earlier in the week or last week even because we had a hearing last week, uh, yesterday, on whether we'd waive the attorney-client privilege inappropriately as to other defendants by turning over materials that were under subpoena in Congress. And we didn't do anything inappropriately. We tried to get all of that material to Congress. But in our submission, we had an email which was dated October 8th, the day before Lev Parnas was arrested, in which one of the president's lawyers, John Dowd, who came on in, I think, to circle the wagons and put a, li a lid on Lev, essentially was apprising Jay Sekulow and Jane Raskin, who were, of course, part of the president's impeachment team, along with Mr. Giuliani and I think his then lawyer, John Sale, explaining to all of those people that Lev and Igor Fruman would certainly not be responding to the congressional subpoenas that they so had you, received. You, you think he was being a back channel and potentially compromising well, that's a back channel. Mr. Parnas? That's a back channel when you're sending a communication about your client to five, six, seven, eight different people yeah. and letting them know that he would be towing the president's line. Let me do this because Mr. Parnas is, yeah. is listening in by phone. I'm going to ask you one question about Mike Pence and I think Chuck Rosenberg then uh, has a question here. Uh, Vice President Pence is also a, a potential person in this whole scheme. Uh, your letter, Lev, says you could testify about it. I should note during the Senate trial, uh, Chairman Schiff was suggesting that there was this extra material uh, from a Pence aide and that it perhaps didn't match and thus could contradict one of Donald Trump's defense. Uh, we should remind everyone we don't know by definition what was in uh, that supplemental material. Um, can you shed any light on that and the role of, of Pence and what would your sources be for that? Uh, first of all, I think it also coincides with uh, what came out today in uh, one of the excerpts in, of, uh, of Bolton's book. Uh, I could definitely validate and because right after that meeting that uh, Bolton had with Rudy Mulvaney, uh, Pat Ciccone, and the president, uh, I met with Rudy right afterwards and I discussed the whole meeting and I was aware of it because we were going to, that was the trip in May that we were going to Ukraine. And uh, it was interesting interesting for me to find out today that Bolton never made the phone call because I was always under the impression that Bolton did make the phone call because I was told by Rudy that Bolton would make the call and that's why they would, everything would be fine and they would greet us. Lev, went, let, let's, let's slow down on that because this is about the new account in the New York Times that is sourced allegedly to Mr. Bolton's forthcoming book. You're saying that Giuliani was under the impression that Bolton was at that time helping to engineer this Ukraine plot and that, in fact, according to Bolton, which may be self-serving, he was already opting out, but they thought, Giuliani thought he was in on it with them? No, uh, Bolton was always against it. He was butting heads with Giuliani going back to even Venezuela stuff. 
So Bolton was against uh, uh, doing it, but because uh, the president told him to do it, uh, we were under assumption that he was going to follow the orders and do you it. You thought he would follow through, and you don't know whether he did or not. I mean, your information is coming from Bolton as well. You don't, you didn't know at the time whether he was or not. It sounds like. Correct. I was. Okay. That, that's not. Well, now it makes sense why they acted the way they acted because uh, they were being told not to meet with Giuliani. Bolton never made the phone call, and they were very skeptical. Right, and then they pressed on to the other channel. Stay with me, Lev. Uh, Chuck Rosenberg. Yeah, I had a question for Mr. Bond, if I may. Uh, really, maybe two questions, Joe, if you don't mind. Yeah. Are you still trying to cooperate with the Southern District of New York? The reason they mm-hmm. may not want to do that is uh, the, the uh, information may not be valuable or credible or thorough and complete. Mm-hmm. So is that still something you're trying to do? And then a second question after that one. I would say our door is open, right? And perhaps now we've reversed things a little bit. Our door is open. On Monday, we'll be in court again, selecting a trial date, a motion schedule, a trial date. But our door is open. Always open. I think Chuck's implying that it doesn't seem like they're currently interested in your cooperation. Oh, I understand that. But I can't imagine why they wouldn't want to have heard from Lev. There must be a very, very good reason. Well, again, typically it's mm-hmm. that they, they don't find it credible, valuable, mm-hmm. or it's not about everything. Mm-hmm. That, that issue came up with Mr. Mr. Cohn, Michael Cohn, where it oh. seemed like he didn't want to talk about certain things. Oh, well, I understand, but that was also late, and he got stuck into this Rule 35 posture. Let us know Michael Cohen, and what he's been saying since before any of this evidence was released has been corroborated by the facts beyond change. The evidence that he had was clearly valuable to the impeachment inquiry. Maybe the Southern District is launching now or moving into high gear with their investigation or even the bringing of charges against people like Mr. Giuliani. Maybe they have a plan to reserve is it, But is that. it... This goes to the heart of it. Is it fair to say that having not secured their interests in your private negotiations, you're now trying to make them more interested in public? Not really. You know, what we tried to do is pretty simple. We're dealing with a very low, what we call, sentencing guideline case. We were facing prosecutors that didn't want to hear what we had to say. We were up against a time crunch with something of incredible importance, the impeachment inquiry. It's not every day that there is an impeachment inquiry and then a trial. And we believe that if we could get our message to Congress, that Lev would be able to make the most profound impact. We're over time, but I want to give Chuck one more quick shot. Your letter sets up a very seldom used defense, a public authority defense. The notion that a defendant is relying on instructions from a senior official in the government and therefore can't be culpable criminally of mm-hmm. his conduct. Mm-hmm. Uh, seldom used, seldom successful. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me about that. Seldom used because the facts often don't support that. Correct. Right? But here, this is a defense right out of what you call the USAM or the Justice Manual. And the defense has been... Right out of the Federal right. Rules of Criminal Procedure. Absolutely. And if you look at the statements of Mr. Giuliani, that he is working as the president's attorney in furtherance of the president, and his statements that Mr. Parnas is indeed working in furtherance of, of his objectives, Mr. Giuliani's objectives, I think we have that defense. Uh, I've got to fit in the break. It's been really fascinating, particularly all of this with the expertise at the table. And Mr. Parnas joining us by phone on a big night when the Senate has moved away from witnesses. Uh, you were one of the ones that some senators wanted, so I appreciate you jumping on the line with us, sir. Thank, thank you, Ari. And before we go, I just want to make one little uh, quick note. I can't wait till the more of the book comes out about what Bolt spoke to Barr about, because Barr knew exactly what Giuliani and we were doing there. So I thank you for having me on your show. And you, th- you think there's more to come that will prove that about Bill Barr? Absolutely. I think there's a treasure trove. Just think about this. There is no such thing as a coincidence. Me and uh, Bolton uh, don't speak. We have uh, There was no interaction. And here you go. All of a sudden, I made the claim that Barr knew because I know he knew. And then Bolton makes the claim that he talk, spoke to him. And Barr calls both of us liars with a statement. So I think the truth will come out. And it's, I think more experts will come out in, in his book. And it's, very in interesting. it's very interesting what you say. And as we emphasize, uh, your, your legal situation, your fact witness, um, but Mr. Bolton, of course, also a fact witness and, and had contact with a lot of these people. We're going to keep our eye on all of it. Lev Parnas, our thanks to you. Joseph Bondi here in New York. Thank you. It is Monday, the 3rd of February of 2020, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is River City Hash Mondays. Well, it's been another one of those weekends like they all are. And uh, I have to say, it's been a very, very uh, stressful morning. I've had some major issues with this Dell. 
it froze on me and uh, I didn't know if I was going to be able to get a show out, but we're working on it. So hopefully things will be fine. We'll be able to format throughout the day and uh, get things out over onto the MacBook so it gets broadcast. But for over an hour this morning, I've been trying to uh, restore this computer and hopefully it will continue working. Hopefully. Well, uh, so uh, we had a Super Bowl. My Niners lost. Darn it. But it was a very exciting game. And uh, I, everybody's talking about the halftime show. I thought the halftime show was pretty good. Oh, yeah, there was some pole dancing in it. And Charlie Kirk was all upset because Charlie Kirk is an incel. Okay, come on. He yells at his erection for and blames women for it. Well, he oughta. And uh, so there's some people who are clutching their pearls because, you know, some women, uh, two women were, were putting on quite a show, I got to say. Uh, I didn't, you know, I thought there might have been some lip syncing there. Uh, Lady Gaga said that she didn't want to see or hear any limp lip syncing. Uh, I think they had some live mics. I think they were really doing the show, which was, uh, look, J-Lo 53. Uh, or I'm sorry, J-Lo is 50 and uh, Shakira is 43. I thought she was 41. She's 43. Wow. Everybody's getting old now. It's really amazing. But Wow talk about uh quite a show it was and uh i i concur with uh uh greg dworkin that that the uh, bill murray um uh, uh groundhog day commercial for jeep that that's my favorite too i really like that one and i'm not even into the halftime show or the commercials but this year i decided well i think i'll check it out and i did puppy bowl i don't watch the puppy bowl uh, you're not going to get me to. It's just not going to happen. I'm very old school that way. You know, back in the day when I was playing, during halftime, we were preparing for the second half. Back in the locker room, I had no idea what was going on in the out there on the field. And I got to tell you, I really didn't care. So it's taken me a long time to come around. It has. Well, let's see what we can do about uh, kicking out Donald Trump, at least in the election, at least <laughs> we better hope we can, because uh, pretty much the Republicans are saying that they cannot remove this guy for cheating in elections because that would set a bad, terrible precedent for the rest of the Republican Party who only wins because they cheat. They have always cheated. Well, let's not be absolute. We know that they've cheated at least since Nixon. At least. I'm not going to put any on us on Eisenhower. I kind of like Eisenhower still. Uh, but, look, if you put Eisenhower in today's uh, political world, he would be a socialist. <laughs> yeah. Highway? Interstate highway? <laughs> what? You were a socialist. You're going to turn us into socialist. We can't have socialism in Kansas City, Kansas. No, you will not have any socialism in Kansas City, Kansas. I can assure you. I can assure you. I uh, put out on Twitter, I'm, I'm afraid what he thinks the Louisiana Purchase was. Or is, because it's still existent when you think about it. I I made the conjecture that maybe he uh, thought that the Louisiana Purchase was a dozen beignets at uh, Café du Monde. In New Orleans, by the way, the French Quarter. So, um, I... <laughs> and the Republicans don't want to remove this guy. I don't blame them. Uh, now we're talking about censure, and I don't think that's going to happen either, because censure means that the Republicans have to point a finger at that guy, and they are not going to do it because this is, uh, you know, you get purged. You may not actually die like in the Night of the Long Knives, though I'm not, I wouldn't put it above this guy. We already see what, he, what he's able to do with drones outside of an air, airport. Jeez. On his own, on his own do pretty much. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, they're going to have uh, their lives turned into a miserable state. The brown shirts, uh, you know, Trump doesn't have to tell anyone directly, though I know that he does. But he doesn't have to tell anyone directly to destroy someone. 
He has his minions do it. I mean, how else do you get a guy to plaster his van with a bunch of pro-Trump weirdness and, uh, you know, like a real cult member there. And then and then make bombs and send them to all of uh, the people on Trump's enemies list. Weird how that happened, you know. Uh, the lone wolves seem to have some kind of direction. I don't know if it's a copy of the catcher in the rye that triggers them. That's the brainwashing tool, you know, the little trigger. I don't know if it's that, but it's something. And it might just be a picture of Trump. That's enough to uh you know get the uh the conditioned behavior to manifest itself into our world very very frightening if you ask me and uh rightfully so because uh did you see those gun toters in the Kentucky state house they just let them they let them go around the uh metal detector and everybody else who didn't have guns had to go through the metal detector. On the same day they were doing this, they arrested a woman on the uh, Capitol Park Police, arrested a woman uh, protesting there, you know, near the Capitol, with a Remove Trump bumper sticker on uh, over her mouth. Not saying anything, just had that bumper sticker over, and they arrested her. Because apparently you can't protest. In the Capitol, apparently not now. But you got some weird guys with tactical gear in the state house showing off their guns, saying, "We tell you what polite political conversation is, because we have the guns." And that was perfectly okay. I think it was a show of force because there's a lot of Darapaska money right now in Kentucky. And one Moscow Mitch McConnell controls it all. Yeah, I know the state house thinks that they do, but it's Moscow Mitch. And Elaine Chow, uh, apparently a tree growing off of his shoulder. Oh, look, Elaine. A uh, Howard Johnson's. I think we'll stop and get some clams. Yeah, very obscure uh, metaphors there. You'll have to look it up. Start with Frank Zappa. <laughs> okay, enough of this weirdness. It's Monday. Okay, we had a we we have a great week ahead of us. State of the Union tomorrow, by the way. And another thing that happened over the weekend, I you know Tlaib better stand up and yell "f you" at Trump. If she's got the guts, I mean, you know, I mean, after all, she just represents the blue collar persons. You can boo Hillary. Why don't we put our our uh, directed anger where it should be directed, please? All right. Somebody's got to stand up and say, at least you lie. I mean, come on. It's called get back. They've been giving us get back for Watergate ever since Watergate. It's about time we gave a little big, you know, get back back, please. All right. What's on the rest of the menu here at the Bistro Cafe, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well, of course, at the top, that was Lev and his lawyer, Bondi. I'm, I'm liking this Bondi guy a lot more. I really am. Well, they got a lot more uh, direct evidence. And Bill Barr is implicated, and Bill Barr is going to be in big trouble. And I expect uh, Lev and Igor to have something convenient happen to them real soon. It always does. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe? Well, Midwestern states consider banning discrimination ba based on hairstyle. Yeah, you got dreads, you got braids. <laughs> you can't rent this house. You can't get this loan. Your kid cannot go to this school. They got to stop that. There is some confusion over what data colleges and universities can provide for the 2020 census. Oh, privacy laws now? Now? Hmm. How convenient, as they say. And Iowa's anger over Trump's ethanol policy could be just the opening the Democrats need. Could be. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Air Asia shares plunged after Britain's serious fraud office alleged Airbus 
paid a $50 million bribe to win plane orders. Well, (laughs) Trump's trying to make bribery legal because, you know, he cares about corruption so much. And Twitter banned financial market website Zero Hedge after BuzzFeed complained about an article linking a Chinese scientist to the outbreak of the fast-spreading coronavirus. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. The bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is our chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. And if you would then please do look to the leftish of the page uh, at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. There is the Patreon link. And thank you to all of those of you who have been so generous in your recurring Patreonage. Uh, we have been able to mitigate our bills and uh, we're putting some money aside to get the, that needed machinery that we've uh, been telling you about for a while now. And he, it seems to be even more dire if this Dell is going to freeze up on me like it did. Boy, that was scary. Hopefully it continues working. It seems to be doing OK now. Knock on wood. Uh, so thank you once again for your generosity. And you know what? We could use more of you. We really could. I'll just be blunt. But uh, thank you to those of you who have been so generous. Oh, I I can't tell you how much it takes the stress away. It really does. In fact, uh, we have a big uh, uh, bill to pay just for our hosting service. And uh, uh, if it wasn't for you, it would be worse. It would be an even higher bill, all told. All right. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that, and we always thank Tom for that and everything else that he does, and he does a lot. (laughs) And you can follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam because I do post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's and then get that posted up on social media, and uh, that at Justice Putnam is one of them. Also, uh, follow the show at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts. The most important part of this spiel outside of the plea for funds, <laughs> pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes. I'm pretty sure it's on Apple Podcasts. Would someone check? Because I think iTunes and Apple Podcasts are the same, but um, I I have to find out what my Apple ID is. I, everything just turns on for me, but when I try to do something, they want my Apple ID. I, I have no idea what that is. So uh, I'll have to find out, (laughs) but if someone can find out, are we on Apple Podcasts? I'm pretty sure we are. All righty. Let's get into this uh, first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. River City Hash Mondays. Don't forget that. And it comes out of the Associated Press by way of the American Independent. Black female legislators in Two predominantly white Midwestern states urged their Republican colleagues to join a national push to outlaw discrimination based on hairstyles such as braids and dreadlocks. Yeah, that's going to happen in the heartland. Come on, heartland's just a nice way of saying a bunch of white people who are really afraid of anybody who's not white. It's It's actually codified in quite a few law books, I'm pretty sure. Legislative committees in Kansas and Wisconsin held separate hearings on similar proposed revisions to their state's anti-discrimination laws. Four black female legislators in Wisconsin and one in Kansas, not to be confused with Missouri, by the way. All of them Democrats said employers and teachers 
often wrongly see white people's hair as the standard for what's clean and professional. Oh, my God. Okay. Imagine waking up every morning knowing you've got to go to work and cannot be yourself. Wisconsin State Rep. Lakeisha Myers, a black Milwaukee Democrat, said during an Assembly Constitution and Ethics Committee hearing, she is the chief sponsor of the bill in Wisconsin's Assembly. Well, I can understand the argument from the Republican side. It's like, well, why won't you just assimilate? You hate America so much you won't assimilate. You really want to have a personal identity? What do you think this is? America? I always thought it was. The proposals would ban bias in housing, employment, and public accommodations based on hairstyles historically associated with race, such as braids, locks, and twists. Well, once again, you know, we're taking every single right away from, from them to discriminate, and they have so few, and hair is one of the last. They have to cling on to the discrimination on hair because, look, they should be able to refuse service. No shoes, no shirt, no looking like white people, no service. Mike Schneider of the Associated Press proper brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. The U.S. Census Bureau this week starts its process of counting students living in college-run housing, but there's confusion over what demographic information university officials can share with the agency. Two weeks ago, the U.S. Department of Education said in a memo to schools they could not, if asked, provide information about student sex, race, and Hispanic origin for the 2020 census. <laughs> the Department of Education? You mean Betsy DeVos put out this edict? How convenient. Now the department says schools are able to furnish such data if they strip away anything that could identify a student. Well, that's one way of doing it. Let's undercount all those Hispanic people in America. The department's new position was issued last week in a revision of a memo it sent out last month to universities about how students living in college housing should be counted. The 2020 census form asked for information about the student's sex, Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin, and race, said the ori original memo, issued on January 14th. However, school officials may not disclose this information without prior written consent from the student. The revised memo says stu schools can furnish the demographic information, provided such data is de-identified. The memo's author... Kalala Superana, acting director of the Student Privacy Policy Office and the agency's press office, did not immediately respond to emails inquiring about the reason for the change because they're conveniently always out of the office. Isn't that how it works in this government? The revised memo noted that the office had revised questions from universities about the earlier memo. Much is at stake, as we know. The 2020 count will help determine the allocation of one and a half trillion in federal spending and how many congressional seats each state gets. And of course, the Republicans have to cheat, even on the census. How else can they win?
Kelly of Reuters brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. In a speech last month to farmers in Texas, Donald Trump won applause as he talked up recent U.S. trade agreements when he tried to boast of his administration's ethanol policy, however, he was met with silence. Iowa swung sharply to Trump's Republicans in the 2016 election, but Democrats hope anger over a relaxation of rules mandating use of ethanol by U.S. refineries could put the corn-producing state in the win column this year. I don't know. <laughs> These people are willing to jump off a cliff for this guy. Just to kick the liberals? Well, we'll see. I think that they haven't solved the farmers' problems in terms of ensuring farmers will have a consistent market for the ethanol they produce. Wayne Moyer, a political science professor at Grinnell College in Grinnell, Iowa, said, It is a sore spot. Federal rules require refineries to blend 15 billion gallons of conventional biofuels like ethanol, which is made primarily from corn into the nation's fuel pool every year. Refiners have long sought waivers exempting them from these rules, while corn growers argue they are crucial to sustain ethanol demand. Well, you got a lot of corn? Let's use it. Over the past two years, the EPA has granted more than 30 waivers to refineries, including the, a facilities owned by Exxon Chevron, and Chevron, stoking the ire of farmers and spurring numerous meetings in which the White House has tried to placate growers' anger. Give them some money, <laughs> like you always do here. We took a bunch of money away from this people over here with their braids and their little twists. They're, they're dreadlocks. We took money from them. We're going to give it to you. All right. While many farmers are willing to make the sacrifice to target what they saw as China's uncompetitive behavior, they were less obliging when it came to giving up demand for their products and what they saw as a concession to the oil industry. Well, <laughs> you're surprised that this was going to happen? Of course they're surprised. Iowa could be crucial in this year's presidential election in the 2018 midterm. Two Republicans lost their re-election bids to the U.S. House of Representatives, giving Democrats a majority of the four congressional seats. Well, we do have an opportunity now, don't we? And we don't ignore flyover country, and we never have. There's only one party that ignores it and panders to it. And uh, they're willing to basically give all ethanol production to Vlad now, wouldn't they? They would. All right, let's get to our break. And uh, when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take to Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, Mercy, Mercy Me. Just Mercy, directed by Destin Daniel Cretton and co-written by Cretton and his writing partner Andrew Lanham, is an unfortunate example of a catch-22 in the Hollywood movie system. Let me explain. For many actors, you want to do a movie like this one. A quiet, moving film about real people where you get to do that old-school Oscar acting. A film where small people deal with big issues that are serious and vital and relevant now. A film where you have to be heroic without guns, superpowers, or killer combat skills. A film that means something. A film that is something. And you've got to do the work to get there. You've got to do the blockbusters, the bro comedies, the horror flicks, and the movies for boys 14 to 18 to get to the spot where you're big enough to call your own shots. The problem is, once you're that big, it's hard for me to see you do something small. You're not a young black attorney straight out of Harvard setting up legal services to get wrongly condemned people off of death row in Alabama. You're Michael B. Jordan, one of the most gorgeous men on the screen today. And you're not a local activist risking physical harm and social ostracism to be the clinic's office manager. You're Brie Larson. I mean, you were just Captain Marvel, the cool one. 
And you're not a small town black lumberman convicted of a murder you didn't do. You're Jamie Foxx in a couple of bad wigs. Sorry, it's true. Good movie, earnest performances, bad wigs. I don't know, maybe this problem is not just Mercy's or Hollywood's, but mine. Maybe I've gotten soft from too many films where when you're oppressed, it's a fist to the face or a sword through the gut. Mr. McGee, don't shred my civil rights and traumatize my family and community with your stubborn bigotry and institutional racism. You wouldn't like me when you shred my civil rights and traumatize my family and community with your stubborn bigotry and institutional racism. You know, this has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. The animal kingdom is a noisy place. There's bird song, choruses of frogs, and lots of lesser known sounds, like the ray gun like sounds of baby alligators hatching and calling for mom. There's lots of videos of them doing this on YouTube if you're curious. When I was a kid uh, growing up, I had a pet alligator, and it vocalized a lot. John Weens, an evolutionary ecologist at the University of Arizona. So I had this baby alligator when I was a teenager, and it, you know, sometimes, you know, I could hear, and when they grow up, they do bellows and slaps and all sorts of sounds. Weens and his collaborator Joe Chen wondered, why did animals start vocalizing in the first place? Well, one hypothesis was that the ability originated in nocturnal animals, because, you know, sound works a lot better than colors or horns or other visual cues when you can't see. Weens and Chen built an evolutionary tree of nearly 1,800 vertebrate species, and they mapped onto it information on whether each lived by day or night and whether they made sound. And so one of the things that we did then was to do a statistical correlation between the evolution of acoustic communication and whether they were active by day or by night. And we found a a very strong relationship. So those that are active at night tend to evolve acoustic communication suggesting that the nocturnal notion was more than just a shot in the dark. The findings are in the journal Nature Communications. This ability to vocalize likely arose independently, multiple times, hundreds of millions of years ago, in frogs, mammals, geckos, and birds and crocodilians. And though vocalization might have originated with nocturnal animals, some night dwellers seem to have lost the ability, like pangolins, while others, which evolved to be active by day, retained it. Like, of course, you and me. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For an expectant mother, taking care of her developing baby means taking good care of herself. One way she can do this is by ensuring she gets vaccinated. If a woman is or might be pregnant during flu season, it's especially important to get her annual flu shot, preferably before the end of October. In addition, women should be vaccinated against whooping cough during the third trimester of each pregnancy. Failure to get vaccinated places both mother and baby at increased risk for serious complications of these infections, including hospitalization and even death. If you're pregnant or planning to get pregnant, Ask your healthcare provider when you should get your vaccines. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1 800 CDC Info. This is a message from CDC. After hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods, standing water and excess moisture help mold grow in your home, garage, and other structures. When you return to a home that has been flooded, Know that you're likely to have mold. Mold puts your family's health at risk. If you have mold growing in your home, you should clean it up and fix other water problems, such as leaks in roofs, walls, or plumbing. Keep your children and pets out of affected areas until you've cleaned. Control moisture in your home to prevent mold growth. To remove mold growth from hard surfaces, use commercial products, soap and water, or a bleach solution of no more than one cup of household laundry bleach in one gallon of water. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. Never mix bleach with ammonia or other household cleaners. It will produce dangerous, toxic fumes. Open windows and doors to provide fresh air. For more information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO.
Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Did you know that when you vote for president, you're actually not voting for your candidate? I'm Tom Harbin, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. Sorry if this is unsettling news, but what's really happening is that you're voting for electors to the Electoral College who have pledged to vote for your candidate and will, presumably, if your candidate wins the popular vote. It's a winner-take-all system, usually statewide, although in Maine and Nebraska, each congressional district decides one electoral vote. But Sometimes, electors don't vote as they had promised to do. Indeed, in 2016, seven so-called faithless electors, five pledged to Trump and two to Clinton, jumped ship and voted for neither of those candidates, which didn't matter because the Electoral College vote wasn't that close. But in another year, a switch in a handful of electoral votes could actually decide who becomes president. In 2000, for example, the final Electoral College vote was 271 for Bush, 266 for Gore. Historical precedent supports the idea that electors indeed can change their mind and vote for whoever they please. That said, the Supreme Court, which previously has never decided this issue, has just taken a case from Washington state which raises it precisely. A decision is expected by June, way better to be sure than the case being before the court in November when the electoral outcome could hang in the balance. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because democracy and advocacy begin with you and freedom can't defend itself. I'm Rick Smith and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1971. That was a day of tragedy for the workers at the Thiokol Chemical Corporation plant in southeastern Georgia. An explosion killed 27 workers and injured dozens more. Explosive material meant for the Vietnam War had instead detonated in Georgia. In the early 1960s, NASA had contracted with the company to build solid rocket motors for the space program. Thiokol acquired 7,400 acres of land at Horse Pen Bluff, an isolated area of land that used to be a plantation. The company built a large 36-building complex. As orders from the space program waned, the company shifted its production to pesticides and munitions. One item they produced was trip flares for use in the Vietnam War. A trip flare is employed by a military operation to secure an area. A flare is connected to a trip wire and ignites if it is triggered. The highly flammable magnesium is a key ingredient to the flares. A fire started in one of the buildings of the plant. The employees were able to evacuate quickly, but they did not leave the area, not realizing the danger of a potential explosion. When the blast came, it could be felt as far as 50 miles away. Some of the victims were hurled 400 feet in the air. An investigation found that explosive materials had been improperly labeled and that the company's fire protection system was woefully inadequate, contributing to the loss of life. After a drawn-out legal battle, victims of the disaster won a federal lawsuit against the company for their negligence. The Vietnam War had taken an unexpected toll on the working people who gave their lives, making trip flares for the battlefront. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor report recorded on Monday, February 3rd, 2020. I'm Mark Belanchi. The labor organization, which represents national union centers at the world level, has condemned a so-called peace plan announced by the United States and Israel. The International Trade Union Confederation, the ITUC, says the plan provides no basis for peace and notes that the Palestinian Authority has already rejected it. The plan allows Israel to annex settlements that have been built on Palestinian land. I talked to ITUC General Secretary Sharon Burrow and asked her about the settlements. The settlements are illegal. 
and uh, international law hasn't changed at all. The US decision is simply a political statement that in reality means they're going to ignore international law. And in that context, what they're actually delivering to Israel is, you know, the green light to go ahead and basically uh, engage in theft of Palestinian land. It's a tragedy, really, because what we want to see is a two-state solution where the borders are clear based on the 67 land map and indeed international decisions by the UN. Peace cannot be delivered if the US is simply saying to Israel, go ahead, take whatever land you want and call it an Israeli settlement and we'll declare it legitimate. What do you think the ramifications will be on the Palestinian people? Oh, it's it's a terrible environment. Anybody who's been to the West Bank and travelled through Palestine, can you can see where the Israeli settlements have already enroached on Palestinian lands. So you have a situation in Palestine where you have three areas, area A, B and C. And area C, which is Palestinian land, is actually not able even to be used. It's supposed to be, I don't know, some sort of neutral territory until there's a peace settlement. But that's already denying productive land to the Palestinian people. And now you're seeing not just Israeli settlements occupying Area B, but enroaching into Area C and even through the access via roads, cutting off Palestinian people from their own lands via these roads that have been built on which they're not allowed to travel. So it's already a divided environment in their own land because of the occupation of Israel. Labor has been supporting the Palestinians in many ways. For example, the International Transport Workers Federation, the ITF, has been running a project to help truck drivers at an Israeli-Palestinian border crossing. I asked ITF project coordinator Majid Salmaru about the situation at the Erta crossing. Erta crossing is a crossing near the north area of the West Bank. The drivers there, as all drivers, workers on back back terminals, suffer from difficult situations. The reason of that, Palestine has no direct access to seaports or airports. Any exports or imports to the country have to enter through Israel, and because Palestinian trucks are not allowed to cross the wall, these goods can only be transported between the Palestinian territories and Israel ports and airports on Israeli trucks. Bertration wall between the West Bank and Israel has therefore created a specific problem, not only for the operation of the Palestinian economy, but for the specific conditions of the Palestinian truck drivers, who have to wait often many hours to receive goods through by Israeli trucks. Also, the goods are transferred from Israeli trucks to Palestinian trucks at a special high security back-to-back terminal. There is no shelter or any facilities such as toilets for drivers waiting area to enter these terminals. So the International Transport Workers Federation, which is ITF, who considers Palestine as one of its priorities, with cooperation with UNIFOR, our Canadian partner, tried to help the driver there to provide facilities to them, include service office, restroom, toilet, and small canteens that provide snacks, drinks with low prices. And that's it. International labor news you can use. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. Accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America. 
where it is currently 31 degrees Fahrenheit. We didn't get the snow that we were expecting uh, over the weekend, but it got cold enough to have it. So there was a lot of uh, dewy frozen ice type stuff, crunchy stuff all over the place, as it is right now. So uh, no actual piling up of snow. Didn't really have uh, a lot of rain when we did have some rain. It was in the low 40s, so not freezing. And it looks like we won't be having any uh, measurable precipitation until Friday or Saturday, where we are expected to have about a quarter of an inch. But that's a bit of time out. We'll see how that goes. And then looks like the beginning of next week, uh, there is a forecast of a rainy mix of rain and snow. Or a winter mix of rain and snow, because it was a rainy mix of rain and snow. It'd be a mix of rain and snow already. All right. We're from the Department of Redundancy Department, you know. Okay, so what else do we have? I did mention that we'll have uh, daytime highs will be in the low 40s, overnight lows in the upper 20s, low 30s. Pollen is rated at none. Air quality index locally is in the good range at 28 parts per million. And the daytime UV index is low at 2. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.36 inches. Visibility is up to 8 miles. And relative humidity is at 88%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. (laughs) London is 50 degrees with a rain shower. Paris is 55 with showers in the vicinity, and they have a flood watch. Rome is 59 and clear, though they have a wind advisory. Kiev is 37 and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 31 degrees with light snow. Hong Kong is 60 degrees with a rain shower. Tokyo is 46 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 66 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 44 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is 50 degrees Fahrenheit, mostly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Anonymous worker bees at Reuters bring us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Shares of Malaysia Air Asia Group and a unit Air Asia X fell today uh, after allegations by Britain's serious fraud office that Airbus paid a bribe of $50 million to win plane orders from Asia's largest budget airline group. AirAsia shares fell as much as 11%, their lowest since May of 2016, while those of AirAsia X tanked at 12% to their all-time low of 11.5 on the Malaysian cent. Malaysia's anti-graft agency is investigating the allegations from Britain. AirAsia has said it never made any purchase decisions that were premised on Airbus sponsorship and that it would fully cooperate with the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, affectionately known there as MAC. Malaysian Security Commission said yesterday, Sunday, it would also examine whether Air Asia broke security laws. The allegations were revealed on Friday as part of a record $4 billion settlement Airbus agreed with France, Britain, and the United States. 
Prosecutors said the company had bribed public officials and hidden payments as part of a pattern of worldwide corruption. Well, Trump will, is trying to make bribery legal so you don't have that kind of corruption anymore. I mean, that kind of corruption can really cause problems. And, and if it's legal, well, that's not a problem anymore, is it? Analysts said the accusation against AirAsia comes at a particularly bad time as airlines grapple with a slowdown in business because of the fast-spreading coronavirus epidemic that has killed more than 300 people in China and disrupted air travel. TA Securities downgraded Air Asia Group stock to sell from buy. We choose the sell first, ask questions later approach to avoid the uncertainty in association with the corruption investigation by Mac, where the impact on Air Asia could be significant in terms of corporate governance. It said in a note, well, I was always told in every economics class that I happened to make the mistake of enrolling in that the number one uh, detriment on value on a company is government regulation. Oh, my. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Evermore anonymous worker bees at Reuters Bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table At West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Twitter Inc. has banned financial market website Zero Hedge From the social media pa- platform after it published an article linking a Chinese scientist to the outbreak of the fast-spreading coronavirus. Zero Hedge said it received a notification from Twitter on Friday, accusing it of violating the social media company's rules against abuse and harassment. The move against the website came as the coronavirus has stoked a wave of anti-China sentiment around the globe. Hoaxes have spread widely online, promoted by conspiracy theorists and exacerbated by a dearth of information from the cordon-off zone around China's central city of Wuhan, where the outbreak began. Twitter confirmed to Reuters yesterday, Sunday, Zero Hedge's account on its platform had been permanently suspended for violating platform manipulation policy. The account had 670,000 followers as of its suspension. A new account has been set up that Zero Hedge says is not theirs, and it already has 11,000 followers. Zero Hedge said it initially thought the suspension was triggered by an article it published about the makeup of coronavirus, but it suggested it later learned that Twitter had received a complaint from online news website BuzzFeed over a separate article, and that was the naming of the scientist. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know that Nat Roots Radio is going to broadcast on. And we'll meet up tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Nat Roots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon 
jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver